Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Today is really special for me to be recording this video because I did not pick the genre. Instead, I made a community post and let the subscribers and supporters choose what they'd like to hear. So therefore, I'm going to mash all of these in the span of three days to keep the mystery going. So that means that today is part one. Kindly watch your screen as I thank those supporters and subscribers that help with today's video. Oh, and I only use first names <laughs> just to make it quicker. All right, so we have Samantha, Susan, Tina, Kimberly, Patty's niece, Denise, Cindy, Jessica, Lisa, Jean, and Sophie. Thank you all so much for picking today's genre. And I think I've selected a really awesome collection of material to you. So without further ado, let me go ahead with the introduction so I can shut up and get to the stories. <laughs> if you are new here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please tickle that subscribe button and set your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. Also, if you are interested in becoming a member or gifting me a coffee as a special thank you, that information can be found in the description box. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or duck and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Terrifying Scary Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. As a kid, most people would say that they had their favorite place to play, either by themselves or with their friends. Mine just so happened to be very specific. It wasn't specific in the sense that a plethora of details had to fall into place just to make it perfect. It was more about the time of year where I'd be able to mingle amongst the high stocks and conceal myself from anything and everything around me. I'm talking, of course, about a cornfield. This was not your average wide spanning flat land field that gets tilled at the same time of year. The big difference with this particular field was that for some odd reason, the farmer who owned the land only sowed the crop every other year. I never found out why, but it might have something to do with the story I am about to tell you. In the early days, I had a small group of friends who lived relatively close to me. During the summer, we would gallivant through the forests and across streams. We would relax by the lake and bike down the dirt road I lived on. But one day, we noticed the cornfield for the first time ever. I'm not sure how we hadn't seen it prior, but now I chalk it up to our adolescent minds being far too distracted with the world around us to notice. But that day... My friends and I all became elated with the notion of running between the rows of corn that stretched higher than our imaginations. We could play various games like hide and seek, tag, and we even knock down different sections and pretend that they were forts. Sorry, Mr. Beasley. That entire summer, we let our minds run wild with the fantastical aura the field provided, and nobody ever told us what we were doing was wrong, or at least impolite. When the crop was harvested, my friends and I were incredibly disappointed, and two of them seemed completely deflated altogether, as if their whole world had been ripped away. I felt for them. I really did, because I, too, had a great sense of sorrow deep within my being for no longer having our place of respite. That school year was the most boring year I can remember. My friends and I drifted apart, and even for people our age, there was a palpable tension growing amongst us that you should only find between estranged adults. Needless to say, we were all extremely unhappy. Winter came and went, then spring followed by summer. 
Believe me when I say I was brimming with excitement over the prospect of returning to the cornfield. And as summer approached, my friends and I reconnected and were all incredibly excited about delving back into the world away from home. However, when my mother told me she hadn't seen any corn growing in the field, I was heartbroken. I told my friends and they all didn't believe her. So, of course, we agreed to meet at my place and ride our bikes to see it with our own eyes. Much to my, and assuredly their, dismay, my mother was right. There wasn't any corn in the field this year. It was nothing but dirt with small vegetation sprouting from it. Once more, we were devastated, and some of us began to wonder if we would ever be able to play in the corn ever again. Another boring year flew by as reality set in further. I started to lose interest in that cornfield. When I would bring it up to my friends, they seemed disinterested as well. It reached a point where we all agreed to just stop talking about it because we were older and therefore we didn't need childish games to pass the time anymore. As summer came and the first fields near me started showing signs of growth, I decided I would bike down alone and check out the corn just to satisfy my wandering mind. Upon coming around the row of trees that normally obscured the field, I saw it in all its green glory. The field had returned, or rather, Mr. Beasley had planted it once again. My heart pounded with joy and excitement. I thought about my friends and if I should tell them about it, but something had a hold on my mind. It was like an exceedingly demanding force beckoned for my presence deep into the stalks. I found myself leaving my bike on the side of the road in favor of entering the field alone without a single rhyme or reason. It was the middle of the day and the sun was high in the sky, covering every far-reaching corner of the field with its nurturing light. But then, you're in the corn. You can't see one row from the next, and sometimes the corn plays tricks on you. I thought that's what happened to me when I started seeing hints of movement rippling between the individual stalks. At first, it seemed like my own eyes were betraying me because the moment I turned my head to focus on the movement, it was gone. But then, I heard it again. There were hurried, scurrying noises weaving in and throughout the field around me, like a host of rats searching for carrion. Obviously, as a kid, I was pretty scared. However, my friend Dorian suddenly emerged from out of nowhere and nearly made me piss myself. Dorian, what are you doing here? I asked, quite perturbed and in the middle of trying to catch my breath. He smiled and flipped his curly brown hair. The same thing you're doing out here, he said jovially. Immediately, I felt remorse. I'm sorry I didn't call and invite you and the rest of the guys out here. I just wanted... I just wasn't sure if the field would be around this year, and I didn't want to get anyone's hopes up. Who cares about them? said Dorian unexpectedly. We can have plenty of fun with just the two of us. Something about his eyes didn't sit well with me. They looked hungry, but being as young as I was, I couldn't come to a rational conclusion. Are you sure? Won't they be mad if they found out we played without them? I asked quietly. His eyes widened, and he reached out and grabbed my wrist. You can invite them tomorrow. Right now, it's just me and you, and I want to show you something. Show me something? I wondered out loud as he began pulling me through the corn. Dorian dragged me for a long time without saying another word. I kept asking him where he was taking me, but he wouldn't answer. He just smiled, and it must have been wide because I could see his cheeks perk up every time he did. Eventually, we came to a small clearing where the corn had been matted down. Dorian smiled again and pointed to a strange object protruding from the center of the circle. 
As I approached it, I realized it was a bone. Altogether, I have a hard time remembering which type these days. At the moment, however, I knew it shouldn't be sticking out of the ground like it was. What, um, what's that? I asked, while inching my hand closer towards it. Doesn't it look fantastic? Shouted Dorian in an inquisitive demeanor. I put it there. Hopefully, something incredible will happen. Wait, you put it there? Where did you get it? I found it. Can you believe that? He was incredibly excited, and I wasn't sure why, because to me, I felt uncomfortable standing next to it. Uh, where did you find it? I asked as the tip of my finger touched it. What even is this? It's a bone, he said happy as could be. I reeled my hand back in disgust and fright. Ugh, a bone? I shouted while trying not to freak out even more. Yes, doesn't it look delicious? Asked Dorian with that same uneasy hunger set deep within his stone gray eyes. Delicious? Why are you being so weird, Dorian? What's gotten into you? Oh, never mind. I just thought you'd like to see it. I think it's neat. He reached down to grab the top of the bone before twisting it around. I think I'm going to go home, I said, scared out of my mind. Okay. Hey, let's get everyone else here tomorrow. But we should come at night. That way we can play some hide-and-seek like old times. But it'll be much more fun if it's in the dark. As I look back on it now, his face looked like what you might see on someone with psychopathic tendencies. I reluctantly agreed, even though Dorian's enthusiasm was unsettling. I don't remember how long it took for me to find my way out of the corn, but I know that by that time I reached the road where my bike was. It was already dusk. As I rode home, I couldn't help but think about Dorian's malignant look of how he was there in the first place. It was my understanding that he was helping his dad clean up their yard on that day, but I could have been mistaken. My mother scolded me when I returned home, wondering where I had been and all that. I told her about Dorian and the cornfield, and she gave me that typical motherly warning of, you better be careful and mind that you don't get into trouble. I don't want to have to clean up after your mess if you anger Mr. Beasley by being in his field. I will, Mama, I promise. I said in retreat and in respect of my mother's wishes. That night I woke up in a cold sweat with my heart furiously beating. I wasn't having a nightmare, so I quickly scanned the room the best I could for a possible reason as to why I was awoken. Nothing caught my eye until I looked at my window. Dorian was standing there with his face pressed against it. I jumped and gasped before regaining my composure. Dorian's elated expression failed to wane, even after noticing he had scared me. I crawled out of bed and went over to my window. I didn't open it. Instead, I opted for just talking through the glass since it was quiet enough. What are you doing here, Dorian? I asked lethargically. I just came to remind you about getting everyone in the field tomorrow night. He was exaggeratingly excited. Yeah, I'll call them in the morning. You should go home. I don't even know why you're out right now. Dorian didn't respond. He simply nodded without taking his eyes off of me before backing away from my window into the dark beyond the reach of a nightlight. Now, I know that wasn't normal behavior, but as a young boy, I didn't know any better. The next morning, I started by calling Ben. When I mentioned the previous day as well as the way Dorian had been acting, he was furious. However, I was able to calm him down by telling the truth. I didn't know the field would be there, and I surely didn't know Dorian would be there either. 
After that, he came to terms with the situation and agreed to sneak out that night. Next, I called Corbin, who wasn't angry nor excited, and strangely enough, he agreed with me about Dorian's behavior. Luckily, I didn't need to convince him because he was already prepared to jump at my beck and call. It was nice not having to explain myself further to any of my friends. Finally, I called Dorian. I wanted to confirm that we were still in fact meeting in the field that night. But when he answered, he was completely confused. I mean, he was almost yelling at me saying, I never left my house yesterday. And you're crazy, Gavin. I admit, he almost had me believing that everything I saw was entirely a figment of my imagination. Fortunately, he managed to collect himself and decide in favor of coming to the field as well, although it was his idea to begin with. My mother suspected something was up and continuously pressed me for information all day long. I was able to dissuade her from asking me after dinner time because I was getting annoyed and I'm sure she sensed it. Finally, night fell, and I waited for my mom to go into her room. When I heard her door close, I grabbed the flashlight I kept under my pillow and snuck out of my window onto the soft grass outside. In the back of my mind, I was worried about whether my friends would actually come over, and another part of me began to feel fear of being out in the dark alone. I was terrified of the dark as a kid. Yes, I admit that. My bike was left out in the rain far too often, and therefore the chain grinded and squeaked from the rust that covered it as I pedaled down the dirt road towards the cornfield. On the way, I met up with Corbin. He had a flashlight attached to the front of his bike as well, as a separate handheld one grip tidy in his left hand. I rode up next to him, and he nearly lost control. It was hard for him to hold the flashlight while holding the handlebars at the same time. Why'd you scare me like that? He shouted as he darted his head in many directions. I, I didn't mean to, I said softly. It really wasn't my intention to spook him. This is so stupid, he said after a short time. He must have been referring to our antics regarding our visit to this cornfield. I know, and Dorian acted like he had no idea what I was even talking about when I called him. He did? Corbin asked, perplexed. That's weird, right? Well, you did say he was already being weird. I wonder if he is trying to trick us or something. Maybe? The whole bone thing has me seriously wondering if there might be something wrong with him bone thing. You didn't mention that this morning. Yeah, he brought me to the spot in the field where a bone was sticking out of the ground. I'm not sure what kind it was, but he asked if I thought it was delicious. Wait, what? That's so weird, Gavin. How are you not, like, freaking out over any of this? Well, I don't know. It's Dorian. Maybe he's just into some weird stuff these days. You're telling me, he said, before the conversation ceased entirely, and we continued riding until reaching the edge of the cornfield. Ben was sitting on his bike seat with a flashlight as well. I was glad everyone opted for bringing one since I had forgotten to mention it on the phone earlier. I looked around for Dorian, but couldn't see him. So I asked Ben, has Dorian already showed up or what? Nope said Ben sharply. You haven't seen him? Uh, not yet. Don't be mean, Ben. This wasn't Gavin's idea, said Corbin. I'm tired and I don't like mosquitoes. Well, neither do I, I said softly. How long have you been here? Ben shrugged. I don't know, like four hours? Four hours? You're lying, I snapped. He chuckled. <laughs> now I've, I've only been here for a little bit. If you should be messing with anyone, it's Dorian, said Corbin, as he scuffed his foot across the dirt. Well, he isn't here, is he? 
asked Ben, while turning his head away from us. Then the sound of spokes clinking sounded off in the distance. That must be him, I said, shining my light down the road. Dorian rounded the corner from the other side of the tree line and came to a skidding halt in front of us. It's about time you showed up, said Ben, perturbed. I don't know what you all are thinking, but I have no idea what Gavin's talking about. I only came down here to see what all the fuss is, said Dorian. Why are you lying to them, Dorian? We were both in the field yesterday. You even came to my window last night. I did not. I was sleeping as the same as you, shouted Dorian. Corbin stepped off his bike and stood in between us. Enough, he said. It doesn't matter now. Let's just get in and see what happens. If Gavin is trying to mess with us, then we'll find out. And if Dorian is doing the same thing, then we'll find out that as well. Corbin was definitely the sensible type, even at the age of 11. Fine, let's go, said Ben hastily. He too stepped off his bike and gripped his flashlight in his left hand. This is so stupid, professed Dorian before throwing his bike across the ground and producing a small flashlight as well. Good, I'm sure this will be over before we know it, said Corbin as he shined his light towards the corn. I'm not making this up, I said under a muttered breath. I was quiet enough that nobody heard me. A breeze picked up as well and likely carried my hushed words away. I took out my flashlight and shined it where Corbin was standing. Apart from the added horror of being dark, the field looked no different, and I still had a yearning sensation for it. Ben and Corbin were first, and Dorian followed. I stayed behind because if Dorian was planning something, I didn't want to be the brunt of it. After walking between the tall green stalks for who knows how long, Dorian disappeared. I mean, one minute he was there, and the next, he completely vanished, as if he just became air itself. I stopped moving and shined my light in every direction, searching for him. Ben and Corbin noticed that a distance had been created for me to them, and they stopped as well. Corbin shined his light at me and shouted, Hey, what's the matter? It's Dorian. He, it, he's gone. Gone? asked Ben, with a certain shakiness in his voice. Yeah, he was right in front of me, and now he's just gone. They both walked up to me and searched with their lights. Well, what do you mean he's gone? Like, did he run off somewhere? Asked Corbin quietly. No, I I'm saying he was standing, or, or rather walking right where you are, and then he vanished. That's not possible, said Ben hurriedly. He always had a knack for pointing out the obvious nature of things. What's not possible? asked Dorian as he stepped out of the corn behind him. His intrusion scared me to the point of hyperventilation, but I managed to maintain my composure. What the heck, Dorian? Where did you go? I asked furiously because I'd been scared. Dorian smiled like the way he had the first day and patted me on the shoulder. I didn't go anywhere. I've always been here. Gavin, you disappeared, remarked Ben. Well, sometimes the field can play tricks on your mind. Huh? uttered Corbin. It was not a mind trick, I said timidly. I wasn't enjoying the feeling of being defeated and refuted at every turn. Oh well. Let's continue, shall we? asked Dorian, seemingly unbothered. I guess, answered Ben and Corbin. I simply followed without saying a word. Further into the field we went, Dorian was acting incredibly strange. He would turn around often and stare right at me with his creepy smile, like some kind of deranged lunatic. He would even march over the stalks without being phased like they weren't there. Then he stopped walking. I have an idea, everyone, he announced. 
An idea? Asked Ben. He was a boy of few words. Yes, let's play hide and seek, suggested Dorian with a scheming demeanor. Hide and seek? Out here? Questioned Corbin. I agree. Maybe if it was during the day, but at night? Count me out, I said fearfully. Nonsense. It'll be fine and fine. I'll start as the seeker. You all got ten minutes to run and hide. You can even turn off your flashlights when you find a spot, said Dorian, with a wry smile and an off-putting chuckle. If it gets me out of here sooner, then sure, said Ben, who was already walking away from us. Then wait, I said, eager to hide with someone so I wouldn't be alone. I'm hiding on my own. I don't want to be caught with all of you, said Corbin, walking the opposite direction. Oh, this is so exciting, began Dorian. All start counting now. One, two, three. Dorian laid on the ground with his head buried in his hands and counted loudly. I could hear him, counting from quite far away. As Ben and I walked for a good while before deciding on a spot, we found an area where the corn grew around a rock. It wasn't huge, but neither were we, so it covered us completely. Ben broke the silence after we settled in for a long wait. I know what you mean now, he said quietly. Huh? Dorian is acting strange. Did you notice how his mood changed entirely? After you claimed he disappeared, I mean. No, I told you, something isn't right, and I don't want to be a coward, but... I'm scared. Me too, he said unexpectedly. At least we aren't like Corbin. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to be uh, by myself either. Thank you for understanding, Ben. No problem. I really just want to get out of here, honestly. I was thinking about just walking back to the road and leaving. Uh, well, why don't we? I asked curiously. He sighed. You know I'm in the scouts, right? Yes. So, what's that got to do with anything? Well, you didn't notice, but the direction I walked was relatively back the way we came. Okay, and? And where's the road? He asked as he turned his head towards me. Despite it being night, I could see the fear in his face. Maybe we haven't walked far enough? I suggested. No, Gavin. I'm following Scout's survival rules. The moment I set foot in this field, I begin counting the time, and even if we diagonally from our starting point, we should still have found the road. That's really why I'm scared. I had never heard him speak that much. Um, don't, don't worry, okay? You've just made a mistake. I said reassuringly. It's not likely, he said matter-of-factly. Suddenly the stalks rustled near us. It wasn't caused by the wind because no breeze accompanied the sound. The noise was definitely reminiscent of someone working their way through the field, and they were approaching our hiding spot. Ben clenched his fists, and I tried to stifle my breath. Then. Corbin appeared and sat down by us as if he didn't just scare the shit out of us. Corbin, what are you doing here? I asked in a harsh whisper. He smiled, not unlike Dorian, and said, I was getting lonely where I was hiding and decided to come find you guys. How could you have found us all the way out there? Asked Ben, scrutinizingly. Oh, it wasn't too hard, plus you two didn't get very far. Not very far, asked Ben angrily. We walked for nearly half the time Dorian should have been counting. I just don't see how it's possible for you to be here, but whatever. Just be glad we're all together now, said Corbin. I felt uneasy sitting next to him suddenly. He seemed like a different person. Yeah, I guess, 
said Ben, returning to his concise wordplay. We sat quietly for a very long time. In fact, I started to get tired, even though fear vastly outweighed my desire for slumber. Only the buzzing of annoying mosquitoes and Corbin's strangely excited breathing kept me awake. After not hearing any more movement or even Dorian calling out the typical, ready or not, here I come, I grew even more on edge. At one point, I wondered if he had left and his entire plan was to trick us into sitting out here for the whole night. Ben nudged me with his elbow and broke my contemplation. What? I said sharply. I'm trying to find the road again, he said while rising to his feet. Oh, are we going to try and escape? asked Corbin enthusiastically. We just aren't going to play Dorian's stupid game, right, Gavin? Ben asked while looking down at me. Right, I said, before getting up as well. I'll be right behind you, said Corbin. He was acting just like Dorian had been, and it was freaking me out. We began following Ben, but Corbin brushed past me to walk beside me. They wove through the stalks in an old fashion that made it difficult to keep my light fixed on them. Then, like before with Dorian, they both disappeared. I started to panic immediately. Guys, guys, where did you go? Don't leave me out here alone, please. I admit, tears began to well up in my eyes. Hey, I was a kid and a scared one at that. I did the only thing I could think of. I kept walking. The field around me fluttered and rustled, and each new sound made my heart skip a beat. The longer I walked, the worse it got, and my body was dripping with sweat. Then Ben reappeared. He smiled widely in a way I'd never seen him do before, and my eyes widened with shock. Uh, what's the matter? I asked with equally widened eyes. Where'd you go? And, uh, where's Corbin? I tried my best to hold back my tears. Eh, don't worry about them. He went far away to hide. No, you're both lying. You both disappeared like Dorian. I shouted back. Come with me, Gavin. I'll get you out of here. He said as he stepped around me to walk the opposite direction we had been walking. Uh, but uh, that's the other way. I thought you knew where you were going, Ben. I must have made a mistake because the way out is over here, said Ben ecstatically. Uh, okay, I said in solemn retreat. Ben started to skip through the corn and I did my best to keep up, but I tripped over something and fell on my face. I remember my cheek being scuffed, my nose hurting. I also remember shining my light on my hand to see it covered in blood. But it wasn't my blood. There was a puddle of it underneath me. It was wet and sticky, an oil-like viscosity. Naturally, I shrieked and Ben turned around with a frightening expression on his face. Before I could ask what was happening, he leaned down and started licking my hand and pulled away from him in shock and said, what are you doing? Delicious, isn't it? He asked with a blood-covering grin. You're scaring me, Ben. What are you even saying right now? He smiled and then took off running. I don't know what to do. I sat there on the ground with a pool of blood next to me before the disembodied voice of Ben echoed through the cornfield around me. Come find me, he said like a careless whisper. I was so lost and confused. My first instinct was to run away, but that had already proven impossible. So instead, I chose to pick up my flashlight and wander slowly through the field, hoping I could make it until the morning. 
In my mind, I hope my mother hadn't found out that I was gone because she would have been so worried by now. My legs were like butter, and it took all the strength I had left just to keep myself standing. As I stumbled through the rows of corn, I started to hear horrible gnawing sounds like an animal feasting on a carcass. At the time, I didn't equate it to that, but now that I'm older, and that's exactly what it was. Upon pushing my way through a row in front of me, I was met with something no kid should ever have to see. Three bodies, each torn to shreds and devoured. Their intestines were scattered across the ground, and their blood was splattered against the wall of cornstalks surrounding them. Their faces were preserved, and it was clear by the vague glow of my flashlight that they were my friends. All of them, including Dorian. Each of them had looks of pure terror, as if they were killed just as they were about to scream. My horrific discovery concealed the true gravity of the situation, because in the middle of the bodies was a fourth, one that was moving. I slowly shined my light directly on it to reveal Ben, a second Ben, the one I had been following. He was eating Corbin's leg and groaning with voracious pleasure, as if he were in ecstasy. He ripped at the flesh with his teeth and seemed completely unaware of my existence despite him asking for me to find him. I also passed out from the sight because I've always had an aversion to seeing large quantities of blood, but luckily I managed to keep myself standing. Ben continued his feasting on our, well, I mean, my friends. I shouldn't even call him Ben anymore. It dined on my friends while I stood there watching. It was grotesque, morbid, and traumatizing. I then made the mistake of taking one agonizing loud step backwards, which prompted it to abruptly stop eating. It spun its head around in an impossible 180 degrees direction and smiled with blood-stained teeth. You found me it said in a sinister tone. Its back shuddered and began to expand like some kind of twisted metamorphosis, and my instincts told me to run, even if there was nowhere to go. So I did. I sprinted away from it, all the while I heard terrible screaming and the voice of Ben yelling, Come back, share in my meal, taste the flesh and become one with me. I wouldn't listen. I just kept running without turning around to look. I could hear it trampling through the field behind me, but I would not let it overtake me. I couldn't let it eat me too. The night had been harrowing, and my childish mind did everything it could to rationalize what was happening, but it couldn't understand. No matter how hard I tried, I don't know how it was possible, but I found the road and my bike along with it, and without hesitation, I jumped on and rode away, only looking back once to see Ben standing on the edge of the field, waving happily. The moment I got home, I rushed inside and woke my mother up. She was pissed at first and didn't want to give me her ear for even one second, but she must have seen the look on my face and, in turn, begun to believe me. She called the police, and I told them my story. I don't think they believed me either, but they went and checked anyway. An hour and a half later, an officer showed up at our door and demanded to speak with me. My mother sat in the room the entire time I was telling him what had happened. He had a difficult time understanding, and he kept asking me if I was sure it wasn't an adult out there. Obviously, I thought I knew what I saw, so I stuck with my truth, even if it did sound outlandish. The officer left my room when I was done and asked to speak with my mother outside. I put my ear to the door to eavesdrop and heard the officer say, 
They found a clearing out there where four bodies were maimed beyond belief. Three of them are children, and the other is unidentifiable at the moment. I don't know what was out there, but your son is lucky to be alive. My mother stayed in my room with me that night, and she softly wept while I remained in shock. It took me a long time to overcome my fear of the dark, an even longer time to come to terms with the deaths of my friends. To this day, I still don't know what happened or what was in that field, and as far as I'm aware, the police have let the case go cold. Worst still, it was revealed that the fourth body found was that of the farm's owner, Mr. Beasley. But despite all that, I drove by that field the other day. I wasn't even thinking when I did. I just happened to take that road. Nobody even owns that land anymore, not since that accident. It's considered cursed ground now, but somehow the field was fully grown. Worst still, Dorian was standing at the edge of the field, waving as I passed by. I pressed my foot to the floor and drove faster than I should have to get away from that damn field. If I could offer a warning to anyone, I would say to always be wary of biennial cornfields. I know I just shared a story, but I was reminded of this event after reading another one of my pieces. My partner was at a bachelorette party at a campground. I was not invited for reasons of being a male, the audacity I know, and stayed up late in case anything happened. She calls me at 12 a.m. panicked, saying, he was just in here and I had to recount everything after taking a few breaths. So, this is her story, not mine, but I was very much involved. After a fun day and a night of drinking, playing games, hiking, swimming, they decided to call it a night. We will call my partner Mindy for anonymity. Mindy decided to finally take a shower after everyone else was turning in and walked to the camp bathrooms. She noticed an older white male sitting on a bench, but he doesn't pay her any mind to listening to something on his phone. She assumed that he was waiting for someone or was just sitting on a bench at night. Campgrounds are full of strange bench sitters. It's one of those timed showers where you push the button to get the water to go. So her shower was very short and she had brought her clothes in, so she got dressed. She heard something else and assumed another person needed to use the shower as she opened the curtain and sees the man peeking into the shower stalls one by one. She was the only person in there, and all she could do was stand there, mouth agape, staring at the man. He realized someone was standing there and when he saw her, his eyes got super wide, and he sprinted away. I told her that the ranger or camp staff should be nearby to let them know immediately, or to at least call the police. But since she was at someone's celebration, she didn't want to disturb anything. I figured there was some shock and didn't want to raise her anxiety by arguing. Still, neither of us slept that night as I waited for her calls and she waited for a man to break into the tent. She tells the ranger the next morning and they say, yeah, we've gotten several reports yesterday about this man, but no one can seem to find him. Flabbergasted that the man had once again caused discomfort. It seems to me like he was trying to muster courage to potentially do something worse, as it was a whole day of stalking, hiding, waiting, and sneaking into shower stalls, but that he was still timid. I'm just glad she came home safely, and I really wished I was there because 
I'm the guy who turns towards explosions, literally happened once, and would love to sate my contained bloodlust by beating down a villain. I became a homeowner about four and a half years ago. It's a nice three-bedroom townhouse, and for a few months, it was bliss. I had great neighbors on either side of me and almost never heard a peep through those walls. Then, one of them sold, and I got this asshole instead. He made a shit first impression by having an absolutely massive domestic fight like a week into living here. It was seriously fucked up. I got the full story from other neighbors, CPS and my own source with the police. He had a fight with his kid. The kid ran outside screaming that his dad had punched him. CPS and police were called by concerned neighbors and the child was removed from the home. I missed all of this and only became aware that something happened when I got up and I started hearing drunken screaming and crashing about. I put my ear to the wall and was able to make out some of what he was saying. It was pretty disturbing and detailed, pretty explicitly, how he's going to beat the shit out of his kid. I called CPS and spoke with the person assigned who assured me the kid was okay and wasn't present in the house. I learned that the boy hadn't actually been struck and had a history of crying wolf to weaponize CPS against his parents. Through my mom, who worked with RCMP, I got the juicy gossip that the kid was removed because of how drunk my neighbor was when they arrived. They had attempted to drop him off at his mother's house, but she was also completely drunk, so he had to go stay with a friend instead. I never heard anything like that again, thankfully, but he's always been a nuisance. Every other day, he has these long, angry phone calls where he paces back and forth, shouting and stomping like a baby. Sometimes I get reprieves where there's days or even weeks of silence. But as soon as I start thinking things are going to be okay, he of course starts up again. I confronted him recently in a bit of a passive-aggressive manner after a particularly bad night where he stomped almost non-stop for about 10 hours. He had what I felt like was progressive dialogue and he agreed he was going to try and keep it quiet. I learned a bit about what's been going on in his life. He lost his job months ago and has been renting rooms to some very trashy people whom he had to kick out after numerous fights. He also seemed to think that his kid was being obsessed with the Xbox Connect was a justifiable excuse. To his credit, he did get a bit better, and he seems to contain his rants to the basement, where it's not going to travel as much. I still hate that stomping, though, and it irritates me to no end that he thinks it's okay to make me a party to all the shit going on in his life. I try to sympathize with him, but I just can't. He's a trashy asshole. His ex-wife looks and sounds trashy as hell as well. He had several different work vehicles across the years, and I'm willing to bet he got fired from each of them because he's a loser. I found his Kijiji ad for a roommate, and it was this shitty picture of a messy bed with laundry everywhere. That's something only a bum like him would find appealing. I also found out that he's been fucking me by not paying his extra fees for almost a year now. We're putting a lien on his house, which is about all we can do for now until he racks up enough debt to act on. I'm sincerely hoping that he has not been able to make his mortgage payments and that he's on track 
for bankruptcy. I would be so happy to get another roll of the dice on some new neighbors. That was the end of part one. Please stay tuned for part two. And that, dear listeners, does bring in close to these true, terrifying, scary stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugar Spike, Tina Mead, Samantha Place, Mrs. Innerscare, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Again, as I always say, thank you for being the pillars that hold back to ashes up and support and to the other subscribers and listeners and supporters thank you as well without all of you i would have no voice thank you if you are sleeping i hope slumberland is treating you comfortably if you're awake i hope you've enjoyed the selection until next time please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Please stay tuned to part two, which will release tomorrow. Peace, love, and light to you all.